Hi, thank you for the warm welcome. Uh, and thanks to the organizers for putting on this conference. I'm very excited to be here. I work at a company based in California called Doctor On Demand. I've been working with Python since 2008. Uh, I moved to Zurich in September. Uh, my husband is doing research at ETH, and so I've been uh, learning about dealing with working from home in a completely different time zone from most of your coworkers. Uh, <laughs> late nights can be uh, unfortunately not uncommon. Now, we've heard a little bit about IPython hinted at in various talks already. Um, I'm going to start with the standard shell. Um, so if you've never used an alternative shell, uh, this, is, this is going to be hopefully a great talk for you um, because the standard shell is better than nothing, but uh, it's not really all that great. In fact, once you start using IPython, you may never really want to go back to the standard shell. So within the standard shell, we can do, you know, x equal 1, y equal 2. We can have reverse search history. We can search within our session history here. Um, but once you start trying to do some more complex things, like say I wanted to write a small function that uh, just prints out the first 10 components of pi, uh, either of the Fibonacci sequence. I either have to tab every time, um, yeah. and this also demonstrates I can't actually edit the whole line right there. It's annoying, so I have to go back and tab every time. Print B. This should actually be a. Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. That's not right either. So anyway, it doesn't it doesn't really play nicely if you uh, if you mess things up and want to go back and correct them. Point made. Um, pip install IPython is all you need to do to get IPython installed. Uh, when you first open up IPython. They tell you your four most helpful commands. You'll see this instead of running Python. We've got this general output. This is the default output for IPython. It'll tell you about what they consider the four most important features. Question mark just shows you Kind of a detailed overview, very similar to the introduction that you'd see on the website. Um, quick ref. Shows you basically an outline of all of the different commands, uh, mostly magic functions, that we'll talk about some of the more useful ones in here. But if you ever forget, or you're looking for something specific, or you're like, I wonder if IPython does something that I haven't heard of before. You're bored one night, can't sleep. Might help you put, put you to sleep. Help is the same as standard Python help. And object. So one of the other features that I put up on the previous slide uh, that's really nice about IPython is um, being able to explore libraries interactively in the shell. So in this virtual env, I installed requests. So now I want to see what's in this library. I haven't used it before. I can see kind of diving in using just by hitting tab as I'm going through. I can see all of the different modules that are available to me. Um, Quest.models, import, tab complete. 
I can see all of my different options here, so classes, methods that are available in the module. And I want to take a look at the request object. Uh, the question mark feature in IPython is very useful. So if you just type one question mark, uh, you'll get information about the init signature, the doc string, um, general usage, the file that it's located in. So if you have an issue where you're not sure what's being sourced because maybe you installed multiple versions of a library and you want to double check something, um, this is a nice way to double check what file is actually being sourced there. If you use two question marks, you also get the source code or a small excerpt of it. So here I can see the class that's defined along with the doc string, the init function, uh, wrapper, prepare. It doesn't give you everything, but it gives you a nice overview. So while you're working in the shell, you can get a lot of the debug information that you need. All right, so that's tab completion. The other nice thing is persistent command history. So if I were to exit out of the standard Python shell right now and open up a new one, I wouldn't be able to search for anything before. So say I was coming back a few days later, I was like, I know I imported that request, mo um, request class from somewhere, but I don't remember exactly where. I can search through my previous session history for requests. So here I'm using control R, and then I can find the import from last time, and I don't have to go through the same process of trying to remember that. So tab completion, very useful for being lazy, exploring libraries, looking through code dynamically. Um, persistent command history, it's actually stored in a SQLite database. And that's where configuration comes into play. So using IPython profile create, if you run this command, it will generate a default configuration file for you. Um, we'll go ahead and demonstrate some of the most useful uh, commands, in my opinion, that you want to configure. So we've got that here. So if I look at my IPython config file, uh, it has, I think, roughly 400 lines. It's well documented, so there aren't nearly that many configuration options, but it's well over 100. We're not going to go through nearly all of them. A um, couple of ones to note. There's a display banner option. So at the beginning, you have that um, series of that four-line information that you may not want to see every time. It's by default on. If I want to turn it off, when I restart IPython, there's nothing there. If I'm getting annoyed by that confirmation where it keeps asking me if I'm sure I want to exit, there's a confirm exit. Assuming I can type. I could this morning, I swear. Uh, right now, confirm exit is set to true. So I'll set that to false. Go back. And it will load the new configuration now. It doesn't ask me if I want to confirm. So maybe I'm feeling like that loading screen is a little boring. Um, I want to add some color to it. I can add my own set of Python lines that I would like to have run every time. So here I've got a few things. Maybe I want it to greet me um, and then remind me what the Zen of Python is before I start working that day. So it runs those lines. Uh, there's an alternative config where you, can, uh, where you can load a file instead of having a list of commands. Um, you can also change your default editor. The default on Linux systems is VI. Uh, it's Notepad on Windows-based systems. So I, I could change it to Emacs if I wanted to, but you know, I'm going to leave it as is. <laughs> I used to use Emacs a lot more, and then after logging into too many small servers, that 
didn't have the uh, space for it, I, I gave up. All right, so the next item on our agenda is magic functions. Uh, magic functions are special commands that IPython knows how to interpret that give you more powerful control over your environment. Uh, cell magics have two percents, and those allow you to operate over blocks of code instead of just on a single line. Uh, the examples will demonstrate what this means uh, much more clearly. Um, run, edit, save, macro, and hist are all things that allow you to operate on files while you're working on things. Um, paste is a nice way of grabbing something from your um, clipboard because if you've ever tried to copy code that has all this indentations from a website, uh, it often doesn't work very well in the standard Python interpreter. IPython knows how to handle that. Um, it will also conveniently take things from the standard Python interpreter, including the uh, greater than signs, and it will uh, correctly paste them in, which can be very convenient sometimes. Uh, PDB, uh, if you run this command, whenever an exception is raised in the uh, interpreter, it will automatically drop you into a debugging session, um, which can be, again, very useful. Uh, push, depopty, and dehist, those are easier to explain in examples. Uh, they're all just command line operations, in fact. So one of the interesting things about IPython that you can see if you do percent alias is, and you can define your own aliases, is all of these commands um, that are available in your file system are also available here, so I can run ls um, or percent ls. There's a configuration setting so that I don't have to put percent, and if it's unambiguous, it will interpret it as percent, so I can see what's in that directory. Um, I can switch to slash temp. I'm in temp directory. I can go back to where I was, and I can print my current directory, which is just the same. Um, So, have the ability to execute bash commands. You also have the ability to run files directly from the interpreter. So, percent run, I have a program in here that prints out Pascal's triangle and hex that I just grabbed off of some random site. Um, you saw that that was in the working directory, so I can just run it directly from here. You can also run profiling. So, if you have a more complex file, and you're interested in seeing what's getting called the most, uh, this will run profiling on it automatically. I can edit that file directly from the interpreter. So say I wanted to print out more lines, or actually, say I wanted to not print out more lines and see how long it would take to run this. Over a thousand times. I can then take my edited code, um, use time it, which will intelligently determine how many loops to run to figure out how long things will take and rerun that. So see how long it takes. So it takes about 685 milliseconds to generate a thousand rows of Pascal's triangle using that algorithm. Uh, time it will, as I mentioned, also intelligently um, determine how many loops to run. And it will even do this from within a loop. So I was playing with this earlier, and I hadn't tried this before. I was actually somewhat surprised that this worked the way I expected it to. Um, so we're going to loop through uh, in steps of 10,000. 
Oh, and the other thing is uh, Pyth IPython will auto indent for you, so I don't have to worry about tabbing every time when I'm inside loops. And it'll do that every time you have a colon. So print x, and then I want to see, oh, import math first. It lets me keep going where I left off. Time it, math.factorial, God for tab completion. Um, and as it's going through, so for zero, it actually seems like it's taking longer than it should. Um, but that's because it's running a significantly higher number of loops for things that take less time. So you can see as you increase the, as you increase x every 10,000, the uh, time that it's taking to run that command is going up. So this is kind of an interesting way to uh, see how fast things are happening in IPython. It'd be interesting to compare with PyPy, but I uh, don't have time to do that. Um, and this should take just a couple seconds. I could break. There we go. I mentioned you can turn on the interactive debugger. As a note, if you raise an exception within IPython, it will still work. And so you get dropped into a, a debugging session within the IPython code itself. All right. So more line magics. Um, auto call allows you to be lazy and leave out parentheses if you don't need them. So if you're using math.sign, you could leave off the parentheses there. Um, SC and SX are actually really useful because you can run um, bash commands and then use the output in the shell uh, in an easier way than calling something like popen. Uh, who and whose will show you the output of uh, your current, um, all of the variables in your current session. Pastebin allows you to select a number of lines in your, um, in your terminal history and we'll upload that to GitHub for you. And Notebook, uh, we'll talk about a little bit more, but that lets you save your current history into a, a Jupyter Notebook for later use. So just to demonstrate a few of these, um, I'll skip auto call because it's easy for people to explore on their own. But say I run SX or, um, sorry, the alternative to SX is it's aliased as uh, bang bang. LS, that gives me everything that's in my current working directory. I can set that to my dir. And then I can do operations on my dir, like list comprehensions and whatever I wanted to in, in an easier way than having to deal with um, outputting to the shell. Uh, Who's is generally more useful. So you can see everything that has entered into my current working space. And uh, one thing I didn't demonstrate just yet is you can also see your entire history here. It's generally more useful to add the dash in um, because often when you're doing something like this, you want to save certain lines to a file. So example.py and say I wanted to save lines, I don't know, 13 to 14. It'll save all of that. Um, and actually translates it to uh, getting IPython magic for you uh, in the file itself. All right. Cell magics. Um, you didn't know that your interpreter was multilingual, did you? But, uh, oh, and that's a typo. That should say cell, not call. Um, so what happens when you run cell magics is bash 
And then I want to run echo. Oh, cell magics, you hit enter, and then that opens up a cell for you, which I can put in as many lines of bash as I want. And it'll execute it. Um, it'll also do this for, as you can see in the slide, um, HTML, JavaScript, LaTeX, and a bunch of other languages that are all listed in there. I'm running short on time. Um, it won't always display them in the terminal. It'll display something like display object uh, because IPython uh, terminal is actually one of the front ends for the IPython kernel that actually does the calculations. Um, another front end that hopefully we'll have time to look at briefly is Jupyter, formerly known as IPython Notebook. Um, SciPy magic, uh, percent matplotlib will bring up uh, plotting for you. Um, PyLab, dash dash no import all will import all of this stuff for you. Uh, the second option will leave off those last two imports, which is very useful if you're doing scientific computing and you don't want to have to run that every time. Um, or you could just have put it in as a startup option in your configuration file, but you know, they did it for you. It was nice of them. Uh, I talked about pasting code already, um, so I think I'll skip that so we have a little bit more time to look at Jupyter. Um, a couple final notes. Uh, there are some interactive demos on IPython, so you can play with those. And there are IPython extensions. So uh, for various use cases, people have put together a variety of um, extensions that are useful for specific use cases. So there are extensions for working with Django. There are extensions for working with NumPy. There are extensions for working with probably almost every package that you've ever heard of um, that people just put in collections of their custom magic functions and all sorts of other useful information. Uh, Jupyter Notebook, formerly IPython Notebook, um, just to reflect the fact, there was a split that became final in terms of the repos, I believe it was last August, um, where they officially broke everything out into separate repositories, just to make it clear. It had been multilingual for a long time, um, but the way that it works is you have different kernels that execute things that are separate from the front end. So in our case, we have a Python kernel running that can be, the front end can be our terminal session or it can be a web application. So let's go over here. We'll start up Jupyter Notebook. That opens up a file here where I can then um, open various notebooks. I think I'll just, this gives you, if you've never seen a Jupyter Notebook before, the way that it works is you want to run these commands interactively. Um, it does expect you to run them in order. So for example, if I tried to run this before I'd run the first one, I get a name error um, because it's actually running it on the other end uh, in the back end, in the kernel, in order. So I had to initialize that first, use shift enter to run commands, and now that I ran the first part, it understands the second. Um, that will sleep, I can hit stop. You get a keyboard interrupt. Uh, this will actually kill the kernel, which is kind of fun. <laughs> it restarts automatically. <laughs> And I, I didn't create this. This is a publicly available, um, one of the publicly available tutorials. I just grabbed it for use here. Standard out and standard error are both output. Um, this just demonstrates that it outputs asynchronously as information is available. Um, and you can play with large output just by Clicking there, it shrinks it to a more reasonable size. If I double click on it, it shrinks it here and then I can um, expand it if I clicked here. And then for really, really long input, it will automatically keep it at a reasonable size for you and scroll. Um, 
I think I'm running too short on time, but as an example of something that isn't running locally, nature has um, a demonstration running on uh, a Rackspace server that shows uh, you know, pretty clearly that your front end can be very far from your back end. Um, we'll skip kind of the basic plotting. Actually, we'll just run it so you can see what it looks like. Yeah, sorry. Oh, it's probably unhappy because of the internet connection. Dying on it unexpectedly. There we go. Um, so it outputs y equals x squared. You can edit this on the fly um, interactively. So I can change this to be, say, sine x. Uh, it doesn't like it. Ah, true. Like it says in the demonstration. And you, um, the only other thing is to correlate with one of the earlier presentations. You can actually play with identifying galaxies in this demo. <laughs> so I'm, I'm over time. Uh, thank you very much.